To eat is a blessing to save Germany. Hello and welcome to the China Podcast. First, let's express our gratitude as ever for listening and giving us feedback. Um, we take everything on board and we're now being listened to on six continents because Africa and South America have joined the party. That's right. And we're only short now of Antarctica if we want to complete that jigsaw. Do you think penguins listen to podcasts? I think their main priority is fish, to be honest, you know. Um, but actually, here's something about emperor penguins, right? So, after the female has laid her egg, she passes it to the male to safeguard during the winter months while she goes off fishing, I right? Stuff, yeah. um, she eventually returns to the colony with a large catch that she unloads from her throat into the open mouth of her hatchling. Then, of course, it's daddy's turn to go off and play. Now, I'm thinking, right, the mother has gone off for a matter of months, leaving the male literally just standing around with an icy wind beating off his back. He needs something to pass the time. Would you agree? Oh, get him a, he get him a pair of headphones. Right, but the problem with that is uh, establishing an internet connection. Across the continent yeah. of Antarctica. Yeah, How never, do you do that? Never mind the continent. You don't need the continent. You just need to focus on getting a little bit of decent Wi-Fi wherever that colony hang out. It's, a, it's an injustice that they don't have any anyway. <laughs> yeah, right. How about a, a huge loudspeaker sitting on like a, a mountain behind them? Behind where they stand. <laughs> Can you imagine it? Dear Emperor Penguins, please slip and fall down the ice carefully. Welcome to the China Podcast. <laughs> Uh, uh, but yeah, these colonies, they're massive as well. Uh, we could have up to 10,000 listeners in one blast of a loudspeaker. Not necessarily 10,000 individual listens, right, as they're all listening from the one source, but it would give our audience ratings quite a boost, huh? Uh, I don't think you'd be able to give, I don't think you'd be able to give them all a pair of headphones. Um, do you think you could? What do you reckon? No, I think it's beyond our capabilities. Yeah, you can't travel anyway, so they wouldn't have us. I don't We'd probably have to do a bit of quarantine. Yeah, two weeks just standing around there in the snow. <laughs> like best, an emperor penguin. Best to just leave them alone. Uh, let them concentrate on the important matters of rearing their young. Yeah, we'd only be a distraction, what? Yeah. Anyway, on that note, let's move away from penguins. Eric, you are in celebratory mood this week, are you not? Yes, I am. Uh, Max Verstappen. Is the Formula One world champion. And we watched the race last Sunday. And it was epic. Full of twists and turns of so many emotions. What <sighs> did you think of it? I was convinced the FIA wanted him to win from the outset. I, I was convinced it was, a, it was a fix. I thought it was a fix. All the way up until the last lap, I thought it was a fix. Well, you call fix when Max didn't get the overtake on the first lap. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that corner... That advantage from that corner, that was a two seconds. You know, well, it was a second and a half easily. And Max mm. stayed on the track. He, he got the corner. It was his corner. Yeah, yeah, he did. So over, he, over he the made line. the overtake, like. Yeah, he stayed within the boundaries. Yeah, and then, like, what is this advantage that's been given back? If you've uh -huh. overtaken somebody and they stay out in front, there's no advantage yeah, given yeah. back. That's it. Like, what goes around comes around. Yeah. Um, but it did seem like the, the FIA were playing to the audience I did it did you know, they uh, wanted to, to show but then how could they know that Lati Latifi was going to spin out because they have, there's a secret button that they pressed yeah they pressed <laughs> the button and it self-destruct on the yeah. Latifi's car yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah right, I am an F1 fanatic I have been for more than 20 years going back to the late 90s when, when Schumacher and Hackman were going mm. head to head and yeah I, I'm a huge Ferrari fan uh, I'm one of the Tifosi, as as they call them in Italy. Um, but yeah, there have been many seasons in recent times, uh, such as just the one gone, uh, when Ferrari, they're not winning. They're not at the top of their game, although they are improving this year. Um, but I find myself ending up cheering for another driver, as well as the Ferrari cars. This season, that driver was Max Verstappen, now the first ever Dutch world champion. Why was I following him? Because he's bloody brilliant. He's class. He's fantastic. He's got that extra dimension to his driving. 
you know, there, no, there's no doubt in my mind that he'll end up on the same platform when he's retired as the Schumachers, the, the Fangios, the Prosts, the Senna's, even the Hamiltons. Hamilton yeah. has seven world championships. Um, he sticks the car on the road and he gets it around the track even when it's not the fastest. Yeah, and that's that's genius. That's the measure of genius. You know, it is. You know. But on Lewis Hamilton, um, there are certain aspects of his character that I admire. Um, but like more often than not, he just winds me up. He winds a lot of people up. And he's won seven titles, as I said. So, yeah, it was high time that someone else got their chance, huh? Yeah. So, well, I, like, I'm a... I'm not a Schumacher fan, but I appreciate what Schumacher was, and seven's enough for Hamilton, as far as I'm concerned. Um, mm. Like, and I think most of the people have, that are that are ten years older than you would 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 say, yeah, it's enough for Hamilton. Let's 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 leave Schumacher where Schumacher is. Um, yeah, seven each. I, I would prefer Hamilton just had the six. You know? I'd prefer he had the six, but he but has for, the seven. But for the past four years, up until this one, he had no challenge. Yeah, this is it. Anyway, so. The Chinese Grand Prix, is that that's off again for 2022, is it? That's been left off the calendar, yeah. Um, it, it could reappear late in the season next year. We don't know. Mm -hmm. There might be some more cancellations. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's the one in Shanghai. Um, but we will have a Chinese driver taken to the field for the first time ever. Guan Yu Zhou. Guan Yu Zhou is the man. Um, and he has been promoted from F2, which is the lower ranked yeah. formula. Uh, before Formula One, um, and he will race for Alfa Romeo next season alongside Valtteri Bottas. Oh, so he'll be the main driver. <laughs> be, Bottas will still yeah. be playing second fiddle. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll see. see. No, uh, well, he, he doesn't need to up his game. He does need Bottas. To, yeah. Um, uh, now there, there isn't a Chinese Grand Prix scheduled for next season, but they do have the license for it, don't they? They, they, they can put it on. Well, they've extended the license by by three years. And can they put on a second race in China? There, Were they, was I reading something about that? Yeah, there's been talk about it, um, which would be really cool. Uh, like, I'd love to see a Grand Prix being hosted in, in Western China with having Shanghai in the east. Yeah. Well, why don't you just put it in Chengdu or Chung, Chongqing? You know, it'd be perfect for it. Yeah, huge cities. Massive cities, and they're beside each other. Huge cities, but... The problem is finding an area of flat land in this yeah. part of the world large enough yeah. to, to host the Grand Prix. That's Un the unless you run the track around the mountains. Yeah, I'm sure they can, they can always tear down a few of those mountains if they want to. That's true, and they've done it before. They'll do it again. Yeah. Anyway, last week, we, we the last two episodes, we spoke about cyberpunk in China. And this week, we're going to talk about something completely different entirely. We're going to talk about a much-loved story about a monkey, a monk, a half-man, a half-pig, a sand serpent creature thing, and a long, arduous journey they take into the West. Yes, this is the book Journey to the West. Many of you the world over will be familiar with it, or at least have an idea of what it's about. But we're coming at this topic from a very interesting angle, because... There's a well-known and contemporary British musician and, and his animation artist pal um, who have a very unique and close connection to the story. Yes, and they are Damon Albarn and Jamie Hewlett. Yeah. As fate would have it, they were both born in the Chinese year of the monkey. I think it's fair to call them a pair of classic English geezers. Ah, they're salt of the earth. Um, best friends too. Art school students, um, they once they once shared a flat in London when Albarn is a multi millionaire and his band Blur were the peak of their powers mm -hmm. in the late 90s, um, it, mid to late 90s. Um, they're best known collectively for forming a band with no members. That's right, yeah. Now that sounds a bit far fetched, mm -hmm. doesn't it? It does. But it's not. Yeah, in fact, it's highly likely that you know of them. They're called. Gorillas, Damon Albarn is the voice and Hewlett is the animator, Hewlett who also made Tanker. Um, the on-screen characters in the music videos, they're his creation. Albarn writes the music and the group are backed up by a rotation of studio mu musicians and special guests. They've been releasing albums on the regular since the early 2000s when Blur were coming to an end. And did you know 
that Damon Alburn described China as cyberpunk some years ago. Yeah, he said that Shanghai makes Blade Runner look bland and look dated. Yeah, and of the Hong Kong islands, he said, the fact that you can get on a ferry and disappear, and in 45 minutes you can be on an island and go to a fishing village, it's so close to this Blade Runner kind of metropolis. Did you ever listen to The Magic Whip? I did, I listened to it three times. I've listened to the live album, I've listened to the... Yeah, I know it, yeah. yeah. Do you know how it came about? Right, and remember here, the blur, they had not been an item since the early noughties. Go on, tell us. Right, okay. So, Blur's most recent record, and we're going now, back now six years, would you believe it? Yeah. Uh, time flies, was the Magic Whip, as, as I've just said. Uh, it was conceived by pure chance. You see... The band got stranded in Hong Kong for five days after tour cancellations in Tokyo and Taipei during their Asian tour of 2013. And in that extremely short space of time, they lugged themselves into a tiny studio down some narrow back alleyway in Hong Kong and recorded a bunch of new songs, songs that would eventually end up on their eighth sure. full-length album. So sure. what else would you do? What else do you do? You're a musician, five days, it's lashing rain outside, probably. Yeah, exactly. You might as well just you know, go on. The, the ferry's been cancelled, there's high yeah. waves. <laughs> but yeah, five, day, five, five days, five days, they did it in five days. Now, just like putting down the basics for the songs, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. the album was later polished and remastered over the next year or so back in England, um, and it became The Magic Whip. Yeah. Uh, but the album is about Hong Kong, right? And Coming 13 years since their previous studio album following their disbandment, it sounded like Blur had never been away. Yeah, it's exactly, it's it's like peak Blur. It is peak Blur. Like, it's it's Blur. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Um, now, as I said, it was entirely inspired by Hong Kong. The songs are about Hong Kong. Um, and from the neon ice cream artwork on the front cover to the lyrics concerning overpopulation on a track like There Are Too Many Of Us or looking at the modern day loneliness of New World Towers, right? But the thing is, and the reason I bring all this up is that this wasn't Alburn's first musical association with this part of the world. Seven years earlier, he wrote an album based on the story and the characters of Journey to the West. But not only that, it was preceded by an opera on the same book. And his adventure, along with his mate Jamie Hewlett, began around the mid noughties Yeah, so how was this all how was this all conceived? Well, for starters, Hewlett and Alburn they were approached by a, a fella called Alex Poots. Um, Alex Poots is from the Manchester International Festival. And he had a little proposal for them that involved Working with a famous Chinese opera director that he's called Chen Shi Jun, and they were quick to express their their interest. Um, off the back of having watched the TV show Monkey, which I also watch and I adore, and it's a Japanese adaptation of Journey to the West, and it was broadcast while there were kids in the seventies and eighties in Britain. It was also broadcast in the nineties, but it was at two o'clock in the morning, which is how I know it. Um, <laughs> but to do so to, to do to do that like to pull this off they both felt the need to immerse themselves in the culture of China to get a proper feel for the story and Chen Shi Zheng he was more than willing to give them a, a guided tour of his country yeah I think that was the right approach I, yeah. would, I would want to do the same yeah you know, like, if I was working on a project you want, you want to see it up close you don't want like you don't if if some Chinese guy came over to England and wanted to do a production of Richard the Third, but didn't understand the intricacies of Shakespearean court politics, mm -hmm. like what would you be doing? Yeah, yeah, you need to do your research. You, you need, need to, to do your research. Like, there's no reason why you can't do it as a like a, why a Chinese group of performers can't perform Shakespeare. Yeah. But similarly, there's no reason why an English group of performers can't do Journey to the West. Yeah, absolutely, and. Hewlett and Alburn, they initially travelled around the southern provinces of China, mostly through the rural areas of Hunan, uh, Guizhou and Zhejiang, where they collected folk songs and they learned how to make dumplings at the same time. 
Um, this trip lasted a couple of weeks, but it made a huge impression on them both. Yeah. Um, it's important for us to give context here. Um, what is Journey to the West? What is it all about? And what made Damon Albarn say that it looks, it makes the Lord of the Rings seem quite pedestrian, which I agree with. Journey to the West is arguably the most popular literary work in East Asia. The novel is an extended account of the legendary pilgrimage of a bug, Buddhist monk called Xuan Zhang. Xuan Zhang. I, I might have my tone wrong. I think it's Xuan Zhang. And he traveled to the Western regions, being Central Asia and the Indian subcontinent, um, actually all the way through uh, Uzbekistan and up to the Caspian Sea, in fact, to obtain Buddhist sacred texts known as sultras. In the story, the Buddha assigns this task to to the monk and he provides him with three guardians or disciples who agree to help him as atonement for their sins. Now, who are they? Who are the disciples? The disciples. Okay, so the, basically, Xuan Zhang, he has no way of protecting himself, so he needs a way of protecting himself. And his three disciples are, in order of importance, Sun Wukong, who is monkey. He's yeah. the monkey king. Yeah. Zhu Baijie. Zhu Baijie. Zhu Baijie. Mm -hmm. He's Pigsy. All right. He's a divine warrior. And Sha Wu Jing. Sandy. And so the four of them, they set off on a journey towards enlightenment by the power and virtue of cooperation. Yeah. Uh, journey to the West has strong roots in the likes of Chinese folk religion and mythology, Confucianist, Taoist and Buddhist philosophy, and the Taoist immortals and Buddhist bodhisattvas. I think I've said it right, have I? Um, or am I close yeah, enough? You're, 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 it'll do. It's a, it'll do. It'll do. It'll, it'll do. do. It'll do. Um, and they're people on the path towards, but yeah, bodhisattvas, they're, they're people yeah, yeah, on yeah, the path yeah. towards Buddhahood. Um, Journey to the West enjoys an enduring legacy in this country and in some other parts of the world. And it's as much uh, a comic adventure story as it is a humorous satire of Chinese bureaucracy or even a source of spiritual insight as it is an extended allegory. Yeah, it is. a Yeah, and it's difficult. It's difficult to figure out who wrote Journey to the West. But a Chinese novelist and poet of the Ming Dynasty, he was called Wu Cheng An, um, he's been credited the most. The book was published in 1592 and preceded by two other shorter versions. The The question of authorship, it's, it's further complicated by the fact that a good deal of the novel's material had been published in the form of folk tales prior to the official publication. Yeah, so on an historical footnote... Journey to the West was based on <coughs> real events. There was a monk, like Owen said, by the name of Xuan Zhang, who lived between 604 and 664. Um, there are other sources who say he was born in 602 and died maybe a bit earlier, a bit very hard one, or, to, one or two years later. Very hard later. to say when he was born. Impossible, yeah. And it's the same with the, the author as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, this guy lived during the late... Xiao Dynasty and the early Tang Dynasty in Chang'an, um, and he became motivated to seek out better translations of Buddhist scripture that circulated at the time. In 629, Xuan Zhang left Chang'an at the tender age of 25 in defiance of Emperor Taizong, who had placed a ban on travel. And why a travel ban? It was a security measure. In short, he wanted to limit the possibility of spies in the country. Mm. But like I said, Xuan Zong, he was a very determined guy. He didn't care too much. And he travelled via Gansu and Qinghai to Xinjiang and up through the Tian Shan Mountains of Turpan. All of which was the Tang Dynasty at the time. Yeah. All of that was the mm -hmm. Tang Dynasty. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And this is what we might refer to as the Silk Road yeah. in China yeah. as well. Um, so yeah, northwest region. Yeah. Of, yeah. the, of the country um and yeah so after leaving china he then crossed into regions that are today kyrgyzstan uzbekistan and afghanistan and then down into northern pakistan 
And this part of the journey took him one year, okay, which isn't too bad, really, for a guy. Yeah. I imagine he's on foot. Yeah, maybe he's got a, around, yeah. a donkey or something like yeah. that as well for part yeah, of it. Who knows? Maybe. Um, but yeah, he then went on through the Indian subcontinents for the next thirteen years. Yeah, um, he he did, he left India in six forty three. So this is, and even though he defied the imperial travel ban. When he left, um, Xuanzang was, he was warmly received by the enter, Emperor Taizong upon his return to Chang'an, Chang'an being Xi'an, uh, in 646. The emperor gave him money and support for future pro projects and the emperor is responsible for the building of the Big Wild Goose Pagoda in Xi'an. And if you've been to Xi'an, you'll know it. Um, it's one of the main tourist attractions and it's absolutely spectacular. I can't recommend it enough. Um, one of my pla favorite places in China. Yeah, I've been there. It's incredible. Yeah. Um, there he stored the, he stored the scriptures he, and the icons that he brought back from India and he recorded his journey in the book. Um, the Great Tan Records on the Western Regions with the support of the Emperor who had, at that stage, he'd, he'd, he'd actually conquered all the way to the Caspian Sea. Um, so he wanted a, a, a script of it. He established an institute that was dedicated to translating these scriptures that he had brought back. His translation and commentary work established him as the founder of the, the Dharma Character School, which is a common name for stream of thought in Buddhism. Xuanzang died March 7th, 664, in the Xingzhou, and the Xingzhou Monastery was established in 669 to house his ashes. And we might come back to that in a later podcast because that's a really interesting place too. Yeah, Owen found something as well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what's most interesting, uh, and more so relative to this episode of the podcast, is that popular and storyteller versions of Xuanzang's journey dating far, far back include a monkey character as a protagonist. <coughs> Yeah, the monkey. So who are the main characters, right? The first one is Tang Sanzang or Tripitaka. And he's a Buddhist monk. His character is based on Xuanzang. In the story, Tripitaka renounces his family. He becomes a monk from childhood and sets off for the Dalia kingdom, which is India uh, to ancient China to receive original Buddhist scriptures and he's helpless. He's, he can't defend himself. Um, he's just a monk. But his, he's just a monk. Buddha's messenger, Guan Yin, uh, helps by finding him powerful disciples who are going to aid and protect him on his journey. And in return, the disciples will be granted enlightenment and forgiveness for their sins once the journey is done because they're all sinners. Along the way, they help local inhabitants by defeating various monsters and demons who try to obtain immortality by consuming the monk's flesh. Like eating the monk. And that's believed to give immortality to whoever eats it. Hmm. All right. So then we have Sun Wukong or the Monkey King. Yay. And for the rest of the podcast, we just refer to him mostly as Monkey. Okay. Yeah. So you don't get lost. Um, so he is an obnoxious character. Monkey was born atop a mountain from a stone egg that forms from an ancient rock created by the marriage of heaven and earth. Born in an egg on a mountain top. <laughs> <laughs> After witnessing a fellow monkey die of old age, he decides that he wants to be immortal and travels around the world to find a way to live forever. He eventually runs into the Grand Master of Bodhi who taught him the 72 heavenly methods of transformation. And he obtains a somersault cloud, which allows him to travel 108,000 li, which is Chinese miles, almost instantaneously. But monkey by nature, he's a rascal. What, what does he do? Well, to cut a long story short, he gay crashes a party in heaven, which he hasn't been invited to. After eating peaches. After eating peaches. Uh, he runs around like a, like a wild thing, makes a big mess, upsets a lot of very important people, 
And the Jade Emperor appeals to the Buddha, who in turn banishes Monkey under a mountain after the latter loses a bet regarding whether or not he can leap out of the Buddha's hand in a single somersault. Quite the trap, eh? Yeah, it's a bit of, pretty good trap. Yeah. Um, so what happens is he's imprisoned there under this mountain for 500 years until Buddha releases him. But only on one condition, that he accompanies Tripitaka, or the Buddhist monk, to India to recover the holy scriptures. Yeah. And so when he was at the party in heaven, he started drinking wine and stuff. And he's immortal now at this stage, which is why he lived for 500 years. Yeah, he ate, trapped in a he rock. ate the immortal peaches. Oh, in, ate the immortal in that peaches garden. and he drank the immortal wine, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and and there's a story behind that, like a like a kind of a... Like a G.I. Joe cartoon where there's a moral at the end of it. There's a moral to that as well. Like, okay. Watch what you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but his primary weapon is his staff. Um, and it's a Rui Jingu Bang. Uh, it's a golden banded stick, right? Uh, and he can shrink it down to the size of a needle. And he can keep it in his ear. Or he can expand it to gigantic proportions. And he also has a, a suit of armor. And these gifts, combined with more peaches of immortality, and and he'd stolen them from the Heavenly Peach Garden where he was watching them, they make him the strongest member of the party by far. Yeah, there's no doubting Monkey's fighting spirit. There's a, there's a, there's a thing here. He was said to be able to carry two mountains on one of each of his shoulders and run at the speed of a, of a meteor. That's one of the, that's a quote from it. Like, we're talking Superman here. Mm. That's what he is. He's Superman, but he's a monkey. Yeah. He's a great guy to have in a fight. Yeah, great to, man to, to have, have in your, have in your yeah, corner. Yeah, you wouldn't want to be against him, like. No. No, no. Not with two mountains on his shoulders. No, no. <laughs> Couldn't know what he'd do with him. <laughs> yeah. um, but did you know that his martial prowess inspired the Chinese fighters of the Boxer Rebellion between the years 1899 to 1901, something we briefly mentioned in our first episode, yeah. uh, talking about the, the Yangtze region. The Yangtze River. And, um, Ghana, but yeah. and if you haven't listened to it, go back and listen to it. Um, but yeah, these guys, these fighters, during the Boxer Rebellion, they actually channeled the combative energy of Sun Wukong, or Monkey, um, to gain what they believed to be superhuman fighting abilities. And this was described by a guy called George Maria Stenz in his, 19, uh, in his yeah, 1907 book, Contributions to the Folklore of Southern Shandong. Stenz was a German Catholic missionary active in Shandong in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. Uh, and he recorded how four boxer youths were chosen as possible vessels Uh, And after a ritual, enticed the deity of Monkey to Earth, in which the possessed individual performed a frightening sabre dance, indicating the great sage had taken control. The great sage had taken control. And Southern Shandong, where he writes about, and the Boxer Rebellion, that's where Hua Guashan is. That's where Monkey... The the mountain. That's the mountain. That's the mountain. That's where he was born. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And there's an interesting connection between a very interesting connection in fact uh, actually goes back to the pagoda to Shunzang and primates and martial arts in ancient China and the narrative of Journey to the West it portrays Monkey as a well-rounded martial artist with expertise in weapons and boxing in one episode of the story it sees the Monkey give a display of his martial mastery and while he and the monk, they're traveling through a, a haunted mountain, his skill is so great that it likens it to the strategy taught in two of the seven military classics of China. Seven military classics of China. There are classic Chinese books and they're all about different things. And like there are, there are classic Chinese mountains, which are, you know, mountains of Buddhism, mountains of Taoism, mountains of ancient China. There are military classic books. You might have heard of one of them. It's... The Art of War by Sun Tzu. Anyway, here we go. Going, so this is from the book. This is it? from the book. Yeah. Right. This, this is from the book. Journey to the West. Right. So, going through this tall mountain and rugged cliff must have made Master Tripitaka rather apprehensive. That's all. 
Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Let old monkey put on a show for you with my rod to calm your fears somewhat. Dear pilgrim. Whipping out his rod, he began to go through a sequence of manoeuvres with his rod as he walked before the horse, up and down, left and right, with the thrusts and parries were made in perfect accord with the six secret teachings and the three strategies. What the elder saw from the horse was a sight incomparable anywhere in the world. Furthermore, Monkey displays his competence in unarmed combat. There's a poem in chapter 51 of the book, for example, uh, which is important because it describes a battle between Monkey and a rhinoceros demon in which they use real boxing techniques. <laughs> what a sight to behold, eh? A rhinoceros in a boxing match. <laughs> I think the monkey might have an advantage. <laughs> I think he might. I think he might. All uh, right. So here's another excerpt yeah. from the book. Hitching up his clothes and walking forward, the find assumed a boxing posture. His two fists, upraised, looked truly like two iron sledgehammers. Our great sage also loosened his legs at once and moved his body to attack right before the cave entrance. He began to box with the demon king. This was quite a fight. Aha! Opening wide the four levels posture, the double kicking feet fly up. They pound the ribs and chests. They stab at gals and hearts. The immortal pointing the way. Loudza riding the crane. A hungry tiger pouncing on the prey is more hurtful. A, dragging, a dragon playing with water is quite vicious. The demon king uses a serpent turning around. The great sage implies, implies a deer letting loose its horns. The dragon plunges to earth with heels upturned. The wrist twists around to seize heaven's bag. A green lion's open-mouthed lunge. A carp's snapped back flip. Sprinkling flowers over the head. Tying a rope around the waist, a fan moving with the wind, the rain driving down the flowers, the monster spirit then uses the Guan Yin palm and pilgrim counters with the Arhat feet. The long range fist stretching is more slack, of course. How could it compare with the close range fist's sharp jabs? The two of them fought for many rounds. None was the stronger, for they are evenly matched. Yeah, now. Many of these boxing techniques, they're still known and practiced to this day. And you'll know the Shaolin martial arts. That's mm -hmm. actually at the base of one of the holy mountains of Buddhism. Yeah. And it's mentioned in uh, Journey to the West. And, you know, they travel through it. And these techniques, they're, they're, there's a book written on Shaolin. They're, they're there. Mm -hmm. They're still known. They're still practiced. And the narrative helps to solidify... A, a connection between the primates and martial arts during the late Ming Dynasty when references to the styles were recorded. And that's a parable, parable that we're going to tell again because there's more to it and we plan on doing a series of episodes on martial arts in China further down the line. Um, but it's going to take, it's going to take a lot of research um, because the whole, whole concept is, it's far reaching. Yeah. Um, so for those of you who want to hear a little bit more about that topic right now, sorry, sorry to disappoint you, but we're going to leave you hanging. Mm. But yeah, wait, wait, it'll wait. be good. It'll be a good one. It will be a good one. It'll be very good. Um, so yeah, I hope you look forward to that. Uh, we'll probably, we need to do a bit of research. So sometime in the new year, maybe go to the Wu Dangsha in the spring. We could join spring festival. We could do. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, we'll see how things are. Um, but yeah, the monk, he's very aware of, of Monkey's poor behaviour record and so frequently keeps him in check by taking advantage of a band that had, had been placed around Monkey's head by Buddha's right-hand man, Guan Yin. Uh, this band, it can't be removed by Sun himself, M Monkey, until the journey's completion. But the monk... He can tighten the band by chanting whenever he needs to chastise him. This spell is referred to by the monk's disciples as the Headache Sutra, which is Buddhist mantra spoken quickly in repetition. Yeah. Um, 
you might have heard them. They might have seen some Harry Krishnas at an airport walking through. They're they're saying sutras, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. uh, Govinda Jaya and that sort of stuff. Um, but anyway, despite him being, despite his childlike playfulness, Monkey doesn't possess a cunning mind. He, or, well, he does. He does could possess. He he, he possesses a. a oh, he's very a, cunning. He's a, he's he's cunning. He's he's a trickster, mm. right? He's he's a trickster hero, um, and his his antics present a lighter side during the long and dangerous trip to the unknown. And after completing the journey, Monkey is granted the title of Victorious Fighting Buddha, um, Dojan Jung Shung Fu, and ascends to Buddha Land. Um, so, what about the remaining characters? Well. Along their journey, the monk and monkey pick up two guys called Pigsy and Sandy, who Owen mentioned um, a while back. Uh, and these guys, they've also upset the gods and have been punished accordingly. And they've similarly been given an opportunity to redeem themselves. Ju Bajie, or Pigsy, he was once an immortal who was the marshal of the heavenly canopy commanding 100,000 naval soldiers of the Milky Way. Now, that's a title. Isn't it? That's some... I want that job. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one for your CV. Yeah, huh? yeah, nobody's touching me if I'm the marshal commanding 100,000 naval soldiers of the Milky Way. Mm-hmm. So, he was an immortal. Yeah. However, didn't all, didn't last for too long because Pigsy once drank too much during a celebration of the gods and he attempted to seduce the moon goddess chong Not cool. And she was married at the time. Yeah. That's not cool. No. And this resulted in his banishment to the mortal world. Okay. Now, that's that's all that's all fine, okay? You know, you still get to live a life. It was 10,000 lives he had to do. Okay. All right. Yeah. So 10,000 lives, that's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot of lives. Mm. Yeah, and every one of them had to end in the same way. Oh. The poor chap. Yeah. Um heartbroken. Yeah. Time is a flat circle. Did yeah. You ever hear that? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that that's all fine but and he was suppo- yeah he was supposed to be reborn as a human but instead he ended up in the womb of a sow due to an error on the reincarnation wheel <laughs> and instead he turned out as a half man half pig monster <laughs> now pigsy he's a very greedy character um, and he could not survive without eating Ravenously. I just had a thought to myself. You know those uh, wheel spins uh-huh. where they have the 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 little finger, the little arrow pointing. Yeah, so to win yeah. money. Yeah, 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 and you spin it. Yeah, yeah, it's stuck on the line. It's stuck on the <laughs> line. It's stuck on the line. <laughs> Between pig and human. Between pig and human. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but he he had a terrible lust for women, um, and it, it gets him into a lot of trouble. Uh, it gets him into trouble with the family of a, a maiden who he wanted to have as his bride. Uh, the monk and monkey arrive on the scene and they help to defeat him. He consequently joins the pilgrimage to the west. Pigsy's weapon is the Jyotra Singpa. It's a nine-toothed iron rake. And he's capable of 36 transformations. So he can turn himself into a pig or a table or... 36 different things and he can also travel on the clouds he's not as fast as monkey but he is noted for his fighting skills um and he's the second strongest member of the team um despite being spiritually the lowest among the group due to his lust for women so spiritually the lowest he's extremely lazy and extremely greedy and he remains on earth following the journey and is granted the title cleaner of the altars with the duty of cleaning every altar in every Buddhist temple for eternity by eating excess offerings. How nice. Uh, then we have Sha Wu Jing or Sandy. Uh, now, on the other hand, he was once a celestial curtain lifting general. Another lovely title. It is. Sandy, Sandy stood in attendance by the Imperial Chariot in the Hall of Miraculous Mists. Jeez, there's another one. <laughs> <laughs> but he is exiled to the immortal world and made to look like a monster because 
he committed the sin of accidentally smashing a crystal goblet belonging to the Queen Mother of the West during a peach banquet. Now, that's due a spanking. It is, yeah. You don't break the mother's kitchen things. You don't go around, especially not the Queen Mother's. No, especially not her. Yeah, I like if I broke my mother's thing, I'd get a spanking. Mm-hmm. If I broke the Queen Mother's thing, no. Oh, Jesus. It'd be a hell of a spanking. There'd be no coming back from that There'd be one. no coming back. There would be permanent red mark on your uh, on your uh, bottom. That would be it. Um, so, yeah. Uh, he then becomes this hideous-looking river monster. Okay, he's been turned into this um, for his sins. And he takes up residency in the Flowing Sands River, terrorising surrounding villages and travellers trying to cross the river. Like with Pigsy, he is subdued by our protagonists when they encounter him and, consequently, he joins their pilgrimage. Now, Sandy's weapon of choice is a magic wooden staff wrapped in pearly threads. Uh, he has 18 transformation methods and he's highly effective in water combat, as you'd expect. Of his traits, he's the most obedient, logical and politest of the three disciples. He seldom engages in needless bickering and serves as the peacekeeper of the group. Uh, he's also the person who Tong or the monk consults when faced with difficult decisions. Sandy eventually becomes an arhat at the end of the journey. An arhat is someone who has gained insight into the true meaning of existence and has achieved nirvana. Oh, lovely. So he gets to listen to Nevermind every day. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay, and to give you a brief, syn- brief synopsis of the novel entails, each episode usually involves the monk being captured, having his life threatened, while his disciples try to find a, an ingenious way of liberating him. Some predicaments are political, others involve various demons, which are mostly earthly manifestations of he- heavenly beings. In addition to the novel's comedy and adventure, Journey to the West has been enjoyed for its biting satire of society and Chinese bureaucracy and for its allegorical presentation and human perseverance in the face of upheaval. Yeah, it can be likened to King Arthur or The Wizard of Oz and so many other tales of a similar nature. Um, In it, the protagonists, they set out on a a long journey cluttered with obstacles to overcome. There are moments of self-reflection when their morals and behaviours come into the spotlight and they naturally find redemption in the end. It is as such a journey to enlightenment. Yeah, it's it's a hell of a book. It's a hell of a book. It's a massive thing. Um, So, what of the opera? Chen Zhejiang wanted to adapt a long story into a shorter version to be performed in London. Now, that's not an easy task by any any means, any manner of the imagination. Like, the book is a hundred chapters long. His stage adaptation of the 16th century novel features imaginative set set design. It was envisioned, envisioned by Jamie Hewlett and intense acrobatics and a libretto sung in Mandarin. Yeah, Journey to the West is undoubtedly a classic of Mandarin literature, but it was important to Damon Alburn to retell it with a sense of contemporary China in mind. Now, the two trips, in the end, yeah, the two guys, they, they took another trip to China um, to collect more folk songs. Yeah. And in the on these trips, it allowed them to take a glimpse uh, of the Chinese psyche, all right, and relay that through music. Alburn had never envisaged doing an opera, but his opera was one that incorporated elements of electronica, kung fu, and a Saturday morning TV feel good factor. Everything right. I love. Yeah. Ever the innovator, he even looked at using everything from car horns to the sound of elevators in his production. Owen. I asked you the other day about your understanding of the pentatonic scale and how it's used when recording music. Can you tell us what it is? Okay, I can. Um, so, a scale in music is you. You. Everybody here that's listening will know what a scale in music is because you've all heard do re mi fa sol la ti do. 
Right. So if we go from do to do, we're going from C to C. Mm-hmm. If I'm in pitch, if I'm in tune. Yeah. So do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti. So that would be C, D, E, F, G, A, B. And if you count that, that's seven notes, right? That's called a heptatonic scale, right? That's seven notes. A pentatonic scale. These are weird because before we get to the higher the note and the higher octave in different countries around the world at the same time with no like independently of each other all these different civilizations all over the world they all came up with their own pentatonic scales a pentatonic scale is five notes between the octaves so if you look at a piano mm. there are seven Seven white notes. Yeah. Seven white buttons yeah. before the before it repeats. Mm-hmm. There are five black buttons. Okay. The black buttons, that's a pentatonic that's scale. Pentatonic scale, right. And particularly the black buttons on a on a piano, <clears throat> that's the pentatonic scale of G flat. F sharp. It's a F sharp G flat. All right. And but di- there are different notes. Different notes appear in different folk traditions mm-hmm. of different scales. Yeah. So when you have the pentatonic scale of C in Western music, we mm-hmm. go C, D, G, A, and then we're back to C. Okay. So we lose the semitone, the, the ones that are on, on a semitone, which are F and B. Okay. Right. So we lose B and we lose F. Um, but it, it might be different in 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 China. Mm. You know, it might go, it might it might have the B instead of the A. Okay, do you know, so it might be a little bit different, and it might be a little bit weird to hear. Yeah, so something in China will sound different to our ear. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly it what it is. It'll sound as if it's out of tune. It'll sound as if uh-huh. it, it sounds as if it doesn't fit there. Mm. But it's five notes. Yeah. A pentatonic scale is five notes. Before you hit the same note again, an octave For, up. Versus the seven that... But versus the seven that you're commonly used to, okay. yeah. Okay, all right, so... And it's used everywhere. It's used in, like, so many rock songs. But yeah. it, it, but it's limiting. It's limiting because there's only five notes. Mm, the mm, extra two notes mm. gives you more options. Yeah, and this is why I bring it up, because Damon Alburn discussed using the pentatonic scale and its restrictions. Um, and he spoke about how he overcame those initial difficulties. Because... His main concern was how, as a Westerner writing Chinese music, he could get away without the whole thing sounding cliche, which is very easily, could very easily happen happen if you're not careful. Um, But he had this eureka moment whilst looking at the Chinese communist star, right? Uh, And what he did was he stuck a small metal star to his mixing desk. He probably, this was probably a souvenir. He brought back from China on yeah. one of his trips. A little badge or something that he bought. And then he assigned each point of the star a note, right? So let's say the top one was a C and another one was a D or a G or whatever yeah. it might have been. Uh, and he then imagined what it would be like if you rotated lots of these stars with the five notes and do it at different speeds. And the sequencing, so, yeah, so he did this and the sequencing was, was in the pentatonic. And so out of this, he devised a number system and it helped him get past that initial stumbling block. Yeah. And he had another minor issue with the choir. You see, when they originally rocked up to Paris for the rehearsals, Alburn said that some of them couldn't sing in the way that they were expected to sing for an opera. Uh, about it's a, it's, a cl- it's a classic Chinese piece of literature. He was looking for a traditional folksy style of voice it's very guttural sound Mm -hmm. um and what he got instead was something very strange something too contemporary in a nutshell it was shite pop so he spoke a beat and the pop idol out of the chinese kids (laughs) 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 who had grown up with bad western musical influences Mm. and i you you have to you have to you have to i wish i could i wish i could just go and just destroy all pop music but i can't um that's my personal preference now alburn he preferred them to be themselves and not to sound western and on that note we can testify 
Alburn also wanted them to sing through Mandarin, which was a decision that he made very early on. Basically, he chose authenticity over bad overdubs. Yeah, and he succeeded. He did. He succeeded in his methods. Um, But for Jamie Hewlett, it was all about designing the opera. Okay? He's the artist. He's the guy who's good with a pen or a pencil in his hand. Uh, and, and But this was a completely new experience for him. And at first he tried much too hard. Each of his proposals were rejected by the director Chen Shi Zheng. Um, and Hewlett, he looked for a solution. Right? He asked the director, what should he do? And the director simply told him, do what you do best. In other words, design an opera. With his band, Gorillas in mind. Genius. That's what he wanted them to do from the start. Yeah. Um, probably communication issues. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> right, why didn't, uh, that would be pretty you know. <laughs> standard, yeah. But anyway, uh, from there on, it became so much easier for him. He achieved flow, as they say. Uh, and he worked out the characters and the set designs, the animation, the costumes, the set pieces, everything. Done and dusted. He succeeded too. Yeah. And I've tried to see the, I've tried to like look for a video of it online. I can't really, I can't find a video of the actual opera. Yeah. Uh, it was, it was staged not in the O2, but behind the O2 somewhere. It was staged behind the O2. He, yeah. uh, that's something they both spoke about as well. They wanted this kind of traditional theater type setup. Yeah. All right. Uh, they wanted a Chinese but, performance, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and like with the acrobats and with everything, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, and and that was that was Monkey the Opera. That was Monkey um, the Opera. But what about Monkey the Record? Mm-hmm. This is another thing, yeah. Yeah. So the album that was to be a studio version of the opera score, and it was to be a much more personal version of Monkey, gorillas in style with more beats and such. Hewlett's in illustrations they became darker. And Damon Albarn wanted the record to be slightly disorientated um, about the things that we take for granted. I actually listened to him say how every time he goes back to this piece of music, he just wants to add more to it and he wants to change it because mm-hmm. it's just, it's a thing that just, um, it's a piece of music that's, that, that, that almost grows with him. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. There might be a sequel. There might be. Um, Probably not at this stage, but there might be. You never know. You never know. Uh, he's got plenty of time. Well, does he? He's always working. He's the, always working. Not Damon Albarn. He's always working. The Gorillas produced two albums in the last few years. Yeah. That I had, I, I was not aware of. Oh, yeah, one of them snuck up on me. One of them snuck both, up on me last they, they year. They both snuck up on and, me. Uh, and I was just, I was just flicking around, and then boom, there you go, a new album. I'm like what? The last one. I was aware of was called Humans, Humans with a, a Z at yeah, the end, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, there's a song in there called "We We We've Got the Power," yeah. and it has Noel Gallagher of Oasis, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, featuring on it, which uh, is cool, very very cool, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, the album right features traditional Chinese instrumentation and harmonies, but also uses many of the same hallmarks of a typical Alburn album, m- m- um, mainly drum loops, post-punk synths, and explosive bursts of noise. It was recast in a more pop context because they wanted the album to sound like a proper record and not a direct take from the stage. As Alburn put it, to express the sense of ancient culture, blending it with the insane modernism of China. Yeah. Um Hewlett's, he, Hewlett shot a live action video for one of the tracks on the album um, called Monkey Bee. Mm-hmm. If it were gorillas we were dealing with, Hewlett would normally put out an animated video. But here he wanted to do something resembling the TV show. And like Albarn, he wanted to maintain the authenticity. And this was the first live action video that Hewlett had ever directed and involved a big production carried out in London. Yeah, so Monkey Bee, it's a miniature film. Uh, the song is just a piece of music, uh, like an extract essentially from part of the opera where Monkey meets Princess Iron Fan, 
All right. Uh, she is one of the obstacles they encounter on their journey to the West. Interestingly, an iron fan is a weaponized Japanese hand fan designed for use in warfare. And there's several types of these war fans and they, they were used by the samurai class uh, of feudal Japan. They Each, have them here too. Yeah. 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 You, you do see them around yeah, in museums yeah. and in places, yeah, especially yeah, yeah. temples and, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, each one had a different look and a different purpose. Princess Iron Fan's fan is a magical banana leaf fan. It is made from banana leaves. Uh, it's extremely large and has magical properties like creating giant whirlwinds, which are capable of extinguishing roaring fires. In the story, our protagonists, they must try and cross the princess's kingdom, which is built on a volcanic plateau. But first, they must obtain her fan so that they can put out the flames in order to continue their journey. Monkey ends up fighting not only the princess, but also her servants in aerial combat, as well as an army of zombie volcano soldiers. <laughs> Lovely. I hope he had his weed mix that morning. Nah, he'd be more into his cocoa pops, no? Uh, probably, I don't know. Maybe, maybe Kellogg's cornflakes. Or, uh, yeah. Yeah, so the the end products, right? Uh, it looks something like a like a Chinese nineteen seventies horror movie version of Monkey. Uh, it's extremely cool. It was really really well done. And if you're familiar with the TV show of Journey to the West, you will see exactly why Hewlett produced this video in the way he did. The 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 TV show is cheesy. It's corny. It's absolutely like the special effects. You know damn well that thing was made in the 70s. Oh, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. It, it couldn't be anything else. Um, but it has a certain, it has a, it has a je ne sais quoi. It has a feel to it that, that you just can't get. You can't get it anymore. It's just, just perfect. Oh, incidentally, the CCTV have one. They have a Journey to the West TV show. And it's on YouTube, and you can watch it, and it's really cool as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It actually goes into his birth a little bit more. The start of the book is actually done a, bit, a little bit better. The story's followed better, and uh, and Sandy's actually a man in it. Okay, yeah, um, that that is right, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Sandy's a, a woman in the in the monkey. Mm. In the, um, anyway, so the record was originally planned for the project to be released under the gorilla's name, but they were they weren't. Uh, able to do so for legal reasons and um understandably so gorillas monkey you can see why they released the thing under the name monkey instead and another thing jamie hewlett and damon albarn also produced the animated intro movie for the 2008 olympics um and featuring characters from journey to the west anyone that's was in the uk around that time look at it you'll remember it yeah, that, yeah, and that 2008 Olympics, of course, being in Beijing at the time, so yeah. it was, it was great timing. Yeah, um, and they're the perfect duo to do such a thing. Yeah, um, but yes, Journey to the West has an enduring appeal in China, as Owen just mentioned. CCTV, they have a show; they still broadcast it very, very regularly. Yeah, um, and the the TV show of, of of Journey to the West, it's been made and remade many times over. Um, while you also have people they dress up as their favorite character mainly monkey for like fun runs marathons festivals and more uh there's a guy called jason Zhuang. he's a a chinese study scholar uh he believes that the allure of the story lies in its powerful narrative and the powerful narrative being of the original 16th century culture it's considered a great story, he thinks, because it tells of important Chinese qualities in which each character represents a different value. And it really does. I, I completely agree. And actually, it will help you understand China a lot, like just just by watching the moral stories that are told, because it is a, a, essentially a Buddhist text. Um, and it's always appealed to young people due to the, its imagination and its sense of humour and readers and viewers alike they love monkey's fighting spirit and his optimistic attitudes towards life and his his playful nature is most beneficial in a modern society 
prone to just just stress yeah like in the work environment right and it's also used by employers in china as a character reference for employees if you are likened to sandy then you are competent and a hard worker pigsy then you chose the right team and followed it until the end if you are monkey then you have super abilities and you're more than capable to do your job if you're like the monk then you have deep faith in yourself and you've got the heart and the drive to achieve your goals listeners which character are you have a think about it which character are you i'm all of them put together I'm all of them in one <laughs> i'm the buddha yeah. <laughs> well if you're the buddha i'm going in <laughs> all right <laughs> i'm just popping around just just decide casting your, your i don't know uh whatever uh, anyway so anyway the character Sun Wukong or monkey he's he's so well renowned that he almost appeared in an indiana jones film Mm, that's right yeah yeah that's what i found out yeah george lucas uh he co-wrote a script entitled indiana jones and the monkey king which jones races against the nazis to find the fountain of youth in africa <laughs> <laughs> oh. As you do, we all want to be immortal hollywood what? we all want to be immortal we do do you want to be immortal Sun Wukong doesn't want to be immortal. He is immortal. He is immortal, yeah. He's like you know, immortal ten times over. Mm -hmm. Like he's he's he had three different peaches. He drank the wine. He had a gourd full of tablets. Like that man will never die. That monkey will never die. So why is he looking for a fountain of youth? And why does he want to help Indiana Jones? Doesn't make any sense. No, it's it, it was Jones. It was, was Jones. For, wasn't yeah. It? yeah. Anyway, it's located in the lost city of the Monkey King. In it, Monkey, he was depicted as an evil immortal who forces Jones to play a game of human chess, killing those living pieces taken from the board. The end sees a benevolent great sage giving Jones his magic staff, telling him, The golden hooped rod will be a faithful friend. It is capable of 100 transformations and will always remain by your side. And the script was eventually scrapped in favour of what would be Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, thankfully. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. And we're going to wrap it up now because that was a long one. We're, we're at an hour and two minutes. No way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but another highly enjoyable episode to make. Uh, you've read Journey to the West Stone. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I enjoyed it incredibly, immensely. Uh, so much so that the first place in China that I wanted to go was? To that mountain. The yeah. mountain where he was born. Liangyanggang. And did you make it up? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Walked up there by myself in the rain. Um, yeah, walked up the mountain by myself in the rain. And from from bottom? From to bottom to top. To the top. How yeah, long did yeah, that yeah. take? Um, well, I walked from the city. Um so it's outside of the city, it's the north of the city, maybe, maybe 10 kilometers. So I left at six in the morning and I got back at nine that night. But I got a cable car down. <laughs> I got a cable car down because once I got to the top of the mountain, I was just done. Well, you didn't cheat. You didn't, didn't get the, cheat. you didn't get the cable car up. I didn't get the cable car up. I got, I, I, I walked up that mountain. You yeah, know, yeah. I walked up that mountain and it, and I even read I I rode a bull halfway up the mountain. You rode a bull. Yeah, I rode a bull halfway. How up does the mountain. one ro ride a bull? They, they have they have bulls. Bulls. Yeah, they have bulls halfway up the mountain. And there's this really weird tree. There's a really weird tree. Did you not have to hold on for dear life? As I did have. Up the I did. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's not that bad. It's like a yeah. It's not that bad. It kind of there's a there's a there's an easy path up. Um, and lots of peacocks and stuff. Um. Yeah, dude, I've I've been I've read the story, I've seen the TV shows, I've been to half of the places in the book, like short of going to Uzbekistan, mm. which I, I don't know, I might, like why not, you know? Yes, someday when mm. the our travel ban has when been our lifted, travel ban has been lifted, or things are easier. Yeah, who we'll, knows? We'll go see the halls of hell. Mm. 
Yeah. Like and subscribe on YouTube. Follow us on Twitter and Spotify or wherever it is you listen to this podcast. If you're living in China and you have WeChat, join our group. We'll talk to you soon. Toodles.